This is Michishin O'Hara, Derm Dermpath at the University of Washington in Seattle. Today we're going to talk about Inflammatory Dermpath 101. Our job as pathologists is to give a really good descriptive diagnosis. I feel like inflammatory things panic pathology residents. And um, I want to tell you you don't have to come up with the answer. Dermatologists are not actually expecting that. What they want you to do is point them in a direction. The main categories that I'm gonna talk about are superficial perivascular, which I will also give you the caveat is the least satisfying category. Psoriasiform, spongiotic, interface slash lichenoid, fasciculo bullous or blistering, granulomatous, vasculitis, and paniculitis. This is our first category. First thing to notice is there's not a lot going on on the surface. There's maybe some hyperkeratosis. I'm not clear if this is real or not, but this is um, normal orthokeratin. Perhaps a little thickening or acanthosis, but not super obvious. There isn't a lot of spongiosis or separation between the keratinocytes. There are a few lymphocytes up there, but our main action is down here in the perivascular. There's some lymphocytes kind of clustered around the vessels. So this is the superficial perivascular differential. The prototypical dermatitis for this pattern of bland superficial perivascular with not a lot of epidermal change is uh, urticaria. There are a lot of other nonspecific things in the differential. Viral rashes, including COVID, just as an FYI, drug eruptions, Here's a clinical example of urticaria. There's a smooth overlying surface and maybe it's a little raised. Um, generally this erythema, if you pressed on this, it would blanch and you can kind of get that feeling. It's more pink than red. And that often correlates with either dilated blood vessels or with inflammatory infiltrates. Uh, most of the time, we're trained as dermatologists to do punch biopsies for inflammatory things, but I appreciate a shape biopsy, especially for something like this. So we see acanthosis, thickening of the epidermis. We see some uh, perikeratin, and it's almost like a, a ceiling, a wall of shingles of perikeratin um, with our uh, dusty nuclei. Um, there may be a little spongiosis in here, but it's not the most striking feature. I think what I noticed the most is that these reedy are very even at the bottom. So we call that regular acanthosis. Also, there's some dilated blood vessels here and this is quite thinned. Um, so this is a psoriasiform uh, rash. And um, in fact, it's probably psoriasis itself. Prototype, obviously psoriasis. But probably number two is either chronic eczematous or chronic atopic dermatitis or lichen simplex chronicus, really where you have lots of scratching and rubbing and the skin gets really thick. There's a differential which I've listed there. How does this correlate? Here's two uh, clinical images of psoriasis. Generally, they're very well demarcated, meaning you can kind of see where the normal skin is and the lesion starts, and often very hyperkeratotic or scaly. We know what that might correlate with on PATH. Um, often quite erythematous, almost this salmon pink color. So we might expect to see some perivascular inflammation, you know, knowing that. And looking back at our pathology, what else do we see? A little bit of this thinning of the suprapapillary plate. What that correlates with is if we were to peel off some of that scale, and patients tell you this, if you peel off the scale, they bleed very easily. And that's actually a clinical sign called ospit sign. And that's um, just you're revealing these dilated blood vessels under the surface. So that's our ClinPath correlation. Here's that scale that we're seeing. You might be struck initially by these huge holes. Sometimes in pathology, the important thing is to know where to pay attention first. The holes are important, but they're not the main thing. We've got some separation between keratinocytes here. There's space between them. That's due to intracellular edema. So this is spongiosis. And turns out that these big holes are just spongiotic vesicles. You might be tempted to call it a blister, but when there's this much spongiosis, most of the time it's it's due to um, the vesicles are due to that. 
Other thing we should find in here are eosinophils, and you can see some eosinophils here. So a spongiotic dermatitis with eosinophils. Honestly, I feel like if you get this and psoriasiform kind of down, you're in pretty good shape for a uh, derm path. Throw in lichenoid and, and you're like second, third year resident level. Prototype atopic dermatitis, contact dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis, dermatology, terminology for eczema. There's our differential. Eczema is a terrible phrase. It refers to everything that's spongiotic basically. So don't ever put that in a pathology report because it's not specific enough. Some clinical images of spongiotic dermatitis, less specific looking than psoriasis, generally less well demarcated, usually erythematous with some scale, often some excoriations indicating that itchiness relating with those eosinophils and sometimes overlying serum crust. There could be some clues to chronicity like lichenification, which means exaggerated skin lines. You can see that there on the right. That's gonna correlate with more acanthosis histologically. When you see vesicles histologically, spongiotic vesicles, that often correlates with seeing even some tiny little vesicles clinically. There's a variant of eczema called dyshydrotic eczema where you can see tiny little blisters like tapioca pearl blisters on the hands and feet. Some acanthosis or thickening again. This time, really no spongiosis, although the cells do look a little paler than we might expect, a little more pink. There is also this sort of wedge shape to some of the reedy and this band-like lymphocytic infiltrate without a lot of eosinophils. If we kind of go back to low power, and uh, for those who know me, I'm a huge low power person. And uh, when you come on your derm path rotation, I'm always going to be like, why are you on more than 5X? Because derm path is a low power specialty. Sorry to the hematopathologists out there. The other thing you see is there's this uh, hypergranulosis here. So accentuation of the granular layer, and it tends to be overlying these wedge shapes or these V shapes of the epidermis. So this is a lichenoid dermatitis, and this one actually happens to be lichen planus. Type lichenoid dermatitis is lichen planus. I'll tell you that most of the biopsies we get that show lichenoid things are not lichen planus. Clinically, lichen planus is quite distinctive, and so most of the time clinicians are like, that looks like lichen planus. So there is a differential. Most of the time it's going to be in one of your other things rather than the prototype. Looking at some clinical images, Lichen planus, you might remember from med school, is the, the P's, purple, polygonal, pyritic, papules and plaques. You can see in this image that where that purple comes from, it's sort of like a gunmetal gray, purple, violet uh, color on most people. Sometimes it's a little subtle. It's itchy, as you can tell, people are scratching here. And up close, we see this thing called Wickham striae. And Wickham striae, there's almost a hint of a white network on top of these and that's just a little subtle bit of scale and it's slightly lacy. We see it really well in the mouth. Here's some Wickham striae on the inside of the buccal mucosa and anywhere where there's lichen planus we see this and what people think this correlates to, it's not totally clear, but probably to either the shape of these reedy or this hypergranulosis. Someone managed to capture this area where the epidermis is still adherent and then this area blistering you can see it dangling off in the wind but it hasn't yet peeled off that's a really nice biopsy and what we see is this subepidermal here's where the basement membrane should be subepidermal split and in that split that cavity there's a lot of eosinophils adjacent to it there's some spongiosis as opposed to this one, the spongiotic one that had those big vesicles. Here, there's some epidermis under that. Compare that back with this one. This one's really full thickness through the epidermis. So we're under the whole epidermis. So subepidermal split. We're in the vesicular bolus or the blistering family. The prototype for this actually depends on where you are in the epidermis, the level of the split. So I just showed you that one was a subepidermal split. The prototype for that is bullous pemphigoid. And these are bullous pemphigoid, pemphigus, super confusing to everybody, even like early dermatology residents, but very different clinically. We can talk about a differential based on where the split is in the skin. There's a very clear differential when you see a subcorneal split in the epidermis, intraepidermal or subepidermal.
Um, so deciding that is pretty important. And some clin path correlation here. Here is that slide I just showed you with that subepidermal split. And what you see clinically, and this is a patient with bullous pemphigoid, are a combination of tense blisters. And that's because on top of these blisters, you have the full thickness of the epidermis sort of supporting them. Combination of those, and where the blisters have ruptured, you see erosions, kind of bordering on ulceration. And then there's some areas where there were old lesions, but we're still seeing intact blisters. Contrast that with an intraepidermal vesicle. So here we see there's, it's just like one cell layer up and there's uh, the epidermis is falling apart a little bit more. This is pemphigus and this is some acanthalysis here with that. And in pemphigus, you tend to, instead of seeing intact blisters, sometimes you can, but most of the time you just see the erosions because these blisters are a lot more fragile. They tend to shear off quite easily and leave sort of raw skin behind. Um, so that, that is helpful clin path. And so when a clinician looks at a patient with a suspected blistering disorder, they're looking really hard to see, are they seeing intact blisters? Because that's really gonna push where they uh, go with their differential. We can go even higher up. This is a subcorneal blistering disorder, and this is staph scalded skin. And here you can see most of the epidermis is actually intact. We just have this plane that's shearing off the very top layer, almost a granular layer in the stratum corneum. And here, what it looks like is almost just like a resolving sunburn, just a little bit of peeling. It might look a little raw underneath, but patients are not complaining that it's bleeding. It's not painful. It's just like, a, like peeling. Uh, this nice punch biopsy, and we can see most of the actions here. Epidermis looks pretty normal. Maybe that's a little thick, not sure, but I can tell you it looks pretty normal to me. The Seeing this infiltrate here with this central kind of bluish tinge, which turns out to be mucin, and then these epithelioid um, histiocytes around that area, and a little bit of lymphocytes too. So this is a palisaded granuloma. This is a granulomatous dermatitis. This part here is quite good for granuloma. Of course, we'd rather see a giant cell if we're going to call it something granulomatous, but you don't always. Um, really, all you need are the histiocytes. Sarcoid um, is the prototype for sarcoidal or naked granulomas, and cutaneous tuberculosis would be the prototype for um, sort of dirty granulomas or caseating. I'll tell you that that is not the most common, though. That slide I just showed you is not tuberculosis. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but um, with that one was granuloma annulare. So it's probably the most common granulomatous dermatitis we see. Anytime we see it, there's a differential. So here's some clinical images of granulomatous uh, things. And the main thing about granulomatous Clinicians will often submit something saying like looks granulomatous or has a granulomatous appearance, suspect granulomatous. And the reason is because there's a kind of distinct color that we see in the skin. First, there's rarely any scale. So it's usually kind of smooth patches as in both of these. You often see kind of a brownish orange, maybe slightly purple, but not violet uh, like the like lichenoid. It's more kind of a brownish tone and you can see kind of in both of these people with different skin tones here there's sort of a almost maroon brown and here it's a little more kind of orange brown so that's kind of a hint that there's some granulomatous thing happening and if we go down the path obviously everything is deeper there's no scale that's that clinical correlation i can't tell you why things are sort of brownish sometimes things that are deeper down end up having distorted uh, color because of this thing called the Tyndall effect, which is just how to, how light is reflected from the um, chromophores in the skin. On low power, looks like not too much. Higher power, we've got some perivascular uh, damage going on. These vessel walls are quite thick, and there's some karyorexis, there's some extravasated red cells around here, some neutrophil, some eos, here's some good karyorectic debris, just neutrophil bits. Here's some fibrin kind of leaking out. So this is a leukocytoclastic vasculitis, LCV. 
prototype for leukocytic classic vasculitis is leukocytic classic vasculitis. So yay, uh, that one we went at. And I'm not even giving you a differential here because you don't have to go any further than this. If you see an LCV, a small vessel vasculitis, you're done. Our job is not to tell people it's IgA, it's hinlock line, that's clinical. We all remember this from med school, palpable purpura. A couple things that you can see clinically and histologically, which are of no import, but can sometimes sort of freak people out, is you can see a little blistering or pustules. And this is because of underlying vascular necrosis and then the surface skin kind of dies. You get these little vesicles or necrotic areas. And then obviously the purpura correlates with all the extravasated red cells. Um, we have a pretty broad punch biopsy with a good sampling of fat here. Ignoring where the action is for a second, always starting at the top, nothing going on really in the epidermis, maybe some superficial perivascular infiltrates, but um, not too striking. What we do have is this pretty dense, deeper down infiltrates. I would classify this as a paniculitis. The inflammation is sort of infiltrating into the fat lobules rather than septal, and we'll talk about that. Paniculitis, there are really two patterns. Our job is to help people push into septal or lobular. Most dermatologists can kind of take it from there. If you can help any further, great. You can't always. The prototype for a septal paniculitis, this is the best diagnosis because there's only one, and it's erythema nodosum. Every other paniculitis is lobular and lupus paniculitis is kind of a good example of that. And here are two examples on the left, septal, so we know that has to be erythema nodosum because that's your only choice, and on the right, a nice lobular. Sometimes they're kind of messy and you can't really tell. Uh, this analogy that I like that um, is used in one of the um, uh, Dermpath textbooks is that septal paniculitis looks kind of like chicken soup, like kind of fat on top of soup. Lobular paniculitis is more like Cheerios floating in milk. When we clinically see something that's smooth or flat, that implies histologically we're not gonna see any scale or there's gonna be very minimal epidermal change. So something like urticaria. Erythema correlates with vasodilation or inflammatory infiltrate, so we're going to look a little harder for that. So when people describe something as red or purpura, we should look for hemorrhage. And when something is a purple or brown color, we're going to think more deeper inflammation infiltrates, maybe lichenoid or granulomatous. Here's a granulomatous. If they describe scale, we're going to look for hyperkeratosis. If they describe an erosion, we're going to look for partial thickness of the epidermis, an ulcer of full thickness, and a vesicular bullae, obviously separation.